hear me well? Markham? Yes? yes. Toronto? Yes. yes. Toronto? And we got Opal in the house. All right. So a continuation of what we left off, where we left off on Thursday. Thank you. Um, and let me tell you, this will, this will continue to be the theme. Okay, for this coming Thursday, we will continue to talk about this, uh, about referral collection. Um, the home office, uh, you know, tracks the data for us. We click view. We have the tracker system, which I will be talking about. Uh, uh, <laughs> the number that we are trying to aim in for, for referrals per presentation. I want you to take ownership of that number. Really, when you walk into a home, you know, we want to to extract that. You know, I have to tell you that whenever you go into someone's home and you are able to collect referrals, it actually increases your chance of selling. Okay? Contrary to popular belief that, you know, I shouldn't rock the sale by collecting referrals. That's not true, actually. Okay? And I can tell you that, and I can promise you that, that that is not true. Collecting referrals increases your chance of closing. Here's why. Think about this for a moment. If somebody's giving you names and numbers of other people, what does that mean? They trust you. They trust you. <laughs> so what's harder, for someone to give you a check or someone to give you names and numbers of other people? A check, right? And you're going to be asking for a check, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour later after collecting referrals. So bless you, Mary. So make no mistake, right? Collecting referrals is a stepping stone to more sales, not just in the home that you're in, but obviously in future homes, right? So, so it go, goes back to the, you know, to the belief that you have to have. So just to recap what we did, what Dave Guzman did last Monday and what I did on Thursday on our training, okay? So Dave Guzman talked a lot about the, the how-to in the home, how to collect referrals, you know? He talked about the belief of referrals. He talked about the closing ratio of referrals, company-wide. He taught you how to roll appointments from referrals in the home. So he talked about all those things. I gave you the system of collecting referrals. Uh, all of you received the referral checklist that we sent out. All of you received that referral checklist. Yes, everybody got it. Toronto, did you get it too? Okay. What I need you to do, folks, for between now and Monday, okay, and I'm not going to check this, so I rely on you to check on this. I rely on you to check on you. Good news is, is we're all adults here, right? I'm not dealing with children here. So you need to right now take those, those referral checklists. You need to print a few of them, okay? And when you come out of the house, just like you should be journaling what you did right, what you did wrong, see that you can answer all those questions with the referral checklist. Once again, if you can't answer 80% of those questions, then you know exactly what you need to work on, okay? Um, with your presentation on rapport building. Fair enough? Yeah? So I need you today to print those referral checklists and every presentation that you make from today till next Monday. Okay? I need you to fill them out. Okay? Because next Monday, I'm going to ask some of you to give me those referral checklists. <coughs> okay? And if you tell me why I forgot to do it, what should I say to you if you tell me I forgot to do it? What should I say to you? No, I'm asking you. I'm asking you. I don't know what should I say, so I'm asking you. What should I say? How many referrals did you collect? Okay. Yeah. But if I ask you where are your referral checklists, and you say, you say to me, well, I, I didn't do them. Well, I should, I should say, well, why? That's the first question I should ask. Why didn't you do it, right? And what should your answer be at that point in time? Roger, what do you think? Well, Is it should there should there be any reason any reason that could be a good reason though? No. Bottom line is this, folks. You know, here's here's the thing. Here's the only the only exception. If you say to me, "No, Byron, I didn't collect my referral checklists, but I collected fifty referrals this last week," and since you're now recognizing our referral collection, let me, let, let me reintroduce myself to you. My name is so-and-so, and you're going to call my name at the meeting because I collected 50 referrals. Am I correct? Yes? 
Yes. When I, by the way, when I'm looking down like this, I'm talking to Markham in Toronto because I have the screen right here. Okay. Right. Okay. When I'm looking up, I'm talking to the people here, even though the camera's right there. Hello. Hello. Right. You know? <laughs> okay. So does that make sense? Toronto, Markham? Yeah. Okay. Get those referral checklists for yourself. First of all, folks. analyze what you're doing on those. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about what, what we're going to do now. So we talked about all those things with David and myself on Thursday. Let me explain to you now how I believe, I believe, and I know you're going to have the most success once you're in front of these people. Okay. Now, before I tell you that, before I go into that, let me just give you the statistics on this. Okay. I want you to know the numbers and I know these numbers may be today a little bit higher or a tiny bit lower but you can count on this statistic when it comes to booking referrals, okay? So let's suppose you collected 100 referrals over the course of two weeks, okay? Which is a lot of referrals, that's 50 a week, right? Okay, of those 100 referrals, okay, 50% of them, 50% of them are not gonna be usable. Not by you, Perhaps by someone else, but likely not by you. And let me explain to you what those 50% will be. They will be out of your area. So if I ask Mubin, Mubin, you work primarily in Brampton, Mississauga, into Vaughan as well, correct? Okay. If you collected a bunch of referrals in Oshawa, right, you may not go to those because they're really out of your territory. You, you don't run leads in Oshawa, you don't go have appointments in Oshawa, correct? Fair to say? Okay. Same thing. If somebody in Toronto who works, you know, the Durham region, right? Let's say Ranjana uh, in, in Markham. You know, you live in Markham. You may work easily Ajax, Whitby, uh, 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 Pickering. Correct, Ranjana? All right. Yeah. So if you collected a referral in Niagara Falls, right, you know, you're not going to go to Niagara Falls, but we got people here that work in Niagara Falls, correct? So it may not be a referral you're going to use, number one. Number two. There's going to be referrals you collect that they give you the wrong number. Okay. That's okay. Listen, you know what? If you have an address and a first and last name, you can Canada 411 the number and try to attempt to get the right number. But sometimes they're going to give you the wrong number. Okay. And it'll be a useless referral because you couldn't get the right number online. Okay. And there's going to be a percentage of those 50% that are immediately not interested. In other words, as fast as you call them, as fast as they tell you, no, don't want it, don't care, whatever it is, cancel it, don't call, whatever. They're not interested, okay? And they will not give you an appointment. So, 100 now becomes 50, correct? Either the other 50% you're not going to work, are unreachable because they gave you the wrong number, okay? Or are not interested right off the bat, Okay? Here's what happens. The 50% that you are left with, okay, those are bookable. Hear me out though, because there's another statistic I have to share with you, okay? Let's say you booked 50 out of 50. Within 24 hours of booking those, 50% of them will fall off. So if I booked a referral appointment tonight, okay, by tomorrow morning, I may get a cancellation on that. And a cancellation will be in the form of, listen, I spoke to um, my brother, my sister, my parents, my friend, whoever gave me the referral, I appreciate it, but I'm not interested, okay? And they're gonna ask you not to come in. I need you to be prepared for that because that will also happen once you book them. Now, I don't know which one it's gonna happen with, so I'm not gonna assume. My job is never to assume, by the way, okay? My job is to book the appointments. <clears throat> So you're left now with 25 referrals to see, correct? Yes, you all follow, right? Out of those 25 referrals, you will have a 50% closing ratio. 50% closing ratio, okay? Because those are the ones that will say yes. Those are the ones that will agree to see you. They know why you are coming. And bottom line is they're willing to listen. And with a great referral presentation, you may have an 80% closing ratio with those. Okay? But let's suppose it's only 50%. Well, how many sales is that? 12 and a half sales, right? So let's just round that down to 12 sales, right? 
let's talk average ALP per household. What, 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 you know, average ALP per household, what? Just give me a number, 800? Everybody agrees, 800? 70 bucks a month? Markham, Toronto, right? Okay, 12 times 800 is how much? <coughs> $9,600 of ALP is the equivalent of collecting 100 referrals. Well, let me, let me do the math then, right? If I take 9,600, right, and I divide that by 100, right, isn't that 96 ALP? Is that, is that what it is? So do you see that number now? Every referral that you collect, right? Assuming at the end, 50% are not gonna see you out of area, can, uh, wrong number, not interested right, away, right off the bat. 50% you're gonna book, right? But by the time you're driving to the appointment or before you wake up the next day, they've fallen off already, right? So you're left with 50% of 50%, which is 25. 25 presentations, right? At a 50% closing rate, was 12 sales. Well, 12 and a half, let's just round it down, okay? That's $9,600 of premium that you can extract from 100 referrals. So the number I want you to think about right now is what is the ALP per referral collected? 96 ALP, right? Folks, you have to look at this business from an entrepreneurial mindset and become numbers oriented when it comes to these statistics. Because you see, if you think of every referral collected as $96 of ALP, why wouldn't you be collecting 200 referrals a week? Is my question, right? At 200 referrals per week, at 9,600, well, I just double that, right? At 96 ALP, that's $19,200 of ALP. I am going to have by collecting those 200 referrals. You see how the math works? See, you, you need to know these numbers. You need to know these numbers for yourself so that in your mind, you're not doing it because it's a drag. See, here's the thing in this business, we will never ask you to do anything that is not meant to make you more successful. <laughs> At no point in time, okay? We're gonna ask you to do something because we know it's gonna make you more successful. And if you're more successful, your manager is more successful. And if your manager is more successful, the agency is more successful, right? So it's a, food, it's, it's, it's a food chain in which we're all tied in, right? It's a system. It's an ecosystem in which we're all tied in. What's good for the agent will be good for the manager and their team. And if it's good for the team and the manager, it will be good for the agency, okay? It cannot be where it's good for one, bad for the other one, and good for the other one. No, 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 no. It's a, it's a benefit across, you know, from agent all the way to the, to the hierarchy. So $96 of ALP per referral collected. Remember that number. And every time you're collecting a referral, you can be adding your production, actually. Right? Think about that. So if you collected nine, ten referrals in a day, simple. There's 960 ALP in those ten referrals. Your job is to get in front of it. You see? And, and that's one way to, in some cases, see, you know, you don't have enough perspectives to look at a business. How many of you agree that a perspective is very important, right? You know, apply it to your own life, right? There's people that see a problem and there's people that see that same problem and see an opportunity, correct? You know, it's all in how you're looking at it, right? You know, and, and, and again, it's, it's about your mindset too, folks, you know? Don't, don't ever wish that, that, that you didn't have challenges or, or things were easy, you know? When things are easy, no one develops, actually. When things are easy, no one is challenged. You know, it's nice when things are going well, but I gotta tell you, success is a very lousy teacher, actually. You know, when things are going well, I mean, people are not learning a whole lot because things are going well. It's when things aren't going well in an area, such as referral collection, is where you have opportunities for growth and advancement. So take that mentality and apply it daily to your, to your activity, okay? All right, so next thing. The, the really important aspect of referral presentations is establishing the trust. Let me use an example on this. 
what is the number one thing, what is the number one reason that, let's say on union leads, right? That a client is willing to listen to us. Why, like, why are they listening to us? And by the way, when I ask these questions, anyone on any office can answer, okay? Because I can hear you very well. So when I, when I ask this, right? I'm not just asking the people in front of me, I'm asking everybody on screen across the GTA, okay? So why, why do you think a union member is willing to listen to us? Because of the union backing. So the union backing, Tara says, Lee says they trust their union. I agree, what else? So on the phone, right? On the phone. Yeah, so on the phone, they're willing to listen because really we're calling based on something they did, right? Is there any chance we would call a union member that didn't send back a card? No. No, no, right? Now, so on the phone, we can obviously use the script to, to, you know, to gain the credibility, but in the home, why are they listening still? Why, why are they still listening in the home? In other words. So... So the, 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 the truth is they don't trust us yet, but they trust the union enough to listen to us. Does everyone agree? Yeah. Right? Because if the union wasn't credible at all. In other words, if, 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 if that piece of mail they got was not a credible piece of mail, why would they have responded to it? See what I mean? So it's very hard for someone not to, not to pay attention to you when they know they created the reason why you're in their home, right? Let me give you a very simple and funny analogy. I'm sure Josh may have mentioned this to people already, but how many of you like pizza? How many of you will have ordered pizza? For the record, I hate pizza pizza. I like pizza no one. It's really not that important, but it's one of those no. Pretty important. But, but here's the thing. Would you ever order pizza from wherever and have the guy arrive at the door and give the guy a hard time? No. And tell the guy, what the hell are you doing here, man? I specifically, did you order a pizza? And, you know, you see how that doesn't make any sense, right? It should make any sense any sense that any union member should, should give you a hard time. Now, I know in reality, there's natural sales assistance, right? Raise your hand if you met the member that doesn't even want to sign the A, B, and D, right? You've all met those members. Okay, fine. That's sales resistance. Don't worry about it. But it doesn't happen with all members. It happens with maybe 10 to 20%, of, not even 20%, 5 to 10% of the members, okay? Every 10 members you see, there's one that just is angry with the world, Okay. And all of a sudden, that morning, they realize the world is chaotic, upside down, okay? Nothing is good, okay? They got into a fight with their spouse. They had into a fight with their co-worker. They got into a fight with their kids, okay? The, the, the lights are going to be switched off, you know? And then you showed up for your appointment, right? And all of a sudden, the world got even worse by your presence, you know? It is always this person right here. Oh yeah, that's right, I booked an appointment. What's this all about? And this, and that, and this, and that, and all of a sudden, you know, 10 minutes later, you're out of the house, right? Been there, right? Been there, yeah? Come on, guys, yes? Okay, don't worry about those. Those are gonna happen. They're not gonna happen often, they're gonna happen less than 10% of the time. Rule number one, anything that happens less than 10% of the time, don't worry about it. That's the exception, not the rule, okay? But most of the time, they're going to say, okay, yeah, come in. And they're going to accept you in their home. You know, and you're going to make it to the kitchen or dining table. Correct? They're still listening to you. Because there's a degree of credibility. Okay? That same degree of credibility, you need to form it and establish it with referral presentations. And the only way you can do that is to build a really good backstory with how you got there. Okay? How you got there is your backstory. How you got there is the credibility that you established when you talked to John and Mary because their brother Peter is someone you met. 
okay? And the only way to establish that credibility is to make it a big deal in the beginning. You can't successfully establish credibility if you don't talk about the person who got you there, okay? Just like how the union got us there in a union appointment, right? Just like on a child safe kit uh, presentation, right? Child safe lead. You know, what got us there is that they were on Facebook. They clicked on an ad. They went on a website. They decided, I want this. <coughs> they put in their name, their address, their phone number, their email. They counted. How many children do we have? Okay. Three. Three. And they clicked request. Do you realize what happens when they do that? Is they get an email confirmation saying we receive your request and the AL representative will visit you to deliver your kits and explain other no cost benefits as well as insurance benefits you're entitled to. That's what they get, right? You know, I've, I've yet to meet a person that says unconsciously, you know what? I did that in my sleep. I actually don't remember. Right? Of course they remember. Okay. So the credibility is there because it was an action they took that got us in front of them. In a referral presentation, it's an action somebody else took and that somebody else is someone they trust, someone they love, actually, right? So your opening to a referral presentation should sound like this, okay? And I can, I'll send you later on, folks, the script, the actual script I've utilized for years on this, but it's very simple. And the only thing that is different maybe from, from what you're currently doing to, to this is maybe just a couple of lines in the introduction. Okay, so let me, let me say right now, this is John and Mary, okay? Let's suppose there's an imaginary Mary right here, okay? So this is after I'm building rapport. And remember, if I did my job correctly, I should know what John does for a living, right? Because I asked those questions when I was collecting the referral, right? So I would have done some degree of rapport at this point. Okay, so John, you know, let me start off by saying that, uh, you know, what your brother Peter has done for you is actually something really nice. And I know that... Um, I really don't know you, actually, and you don't know me, but obviously we, we both know Peter. I mean, he's your brother, right? Uh, and I'm gonna base on the th I'm gonna base this on the fact that that you trust your brother. Am I correct? Yeah. You do? Okay, good. Good. So because you do trust your brother, you know he's done something really amazing for you. He's giving you access to some really unique benefits. Okay. And then I go in to introduce the company. Now the name of my company is, and I'm on track with the script at that point in time. That little alteration in the beginning, see, if, if he admits that he trusts his brother, right, it's very hard for him to give me a hard time right now because he knows my actions are based on the fact that his brother got me in front of him, right? You know, you can add this to the line, right? So we'll go back and say, you know, I'm going to base on the fact, I'm going to base this on the fact, John, that you trust your brother, obviously, right? And as I ask the question, I'm nodding yes. In other words, mirroring the fact that he's going to also say, yes, yeah, I trust my brother. Obviously, you know, he wouldn't send me out here to do any harm to you. Correct? Good. So based on that relationship of trust, you know, uh, your brother did something quite amazing for you, right? And that is he sponsored you to receive some really unique benefits. And then I can go right into my presentation after that. When I talk about the company, you know, I work for American Income Life. We're not, we're not your typical insurance company. We don't knock on doors. Uh, we don't solicit or advertise. We actually only visit working families and primarily members of organizations such as unions, right? And through the sponsorship program, they're able to extend the same benefits they were entitled to to friends and family at no cost, right? So what I'll do today is I'll go over those no cost benefits. I'll explain to you a package of supplemental benefits after. And all I ask is that if it makes sense to you and you see how it can be beneficial to your family, you give me a simple yes or no today. Is that fair enough, John? Yeah? Awesome. And then I go through my presentation, right? But I'm establishing the fact that John trusts his brother. And it's really cool sometimes when parents refer kids because then I ask the question to them, you know, uh, Mary, is it fair to say you trust your mother, right? What do you think they're going to say? They're actually going to laugh and say, well, yeah, I do, right? And then I'm going, I'm, I'm fair to say that she wouldn't send me out here to do any harm to you. Of course, right? It's very hard for that person now to give me a hard time because I've made them say, I trust who sent you to me 
and they would not harm me in any way, shape, or form. Does that make sense? See, when that registers in their head, because see, here's what I want from them from the beginning. What do you what do you want someone to do the minute you get into their house? Yes, build trust, yeah. Looking for something else though. Break, yeah. You want someone to listen to you, right? Have you ever made a presentation where you know they're not listening? They're just actually waiting for you to do your thing and they're gonna say, no man, thanks, but no thanks, right? You know sometimes when someone's really just being polite, right? And waiting for you to be done so they can say whatever they wanna say, right? And you also know when somebody's attentively listening to you, absorbing your presentation, and kind of nodding and, and leaning forward, actually. I love when people do that. When they lean forward to watch a video, when they lean forward to listen to you. When they ask you for a suggestion, what do you think we should do here? You see, that's someone interested in what you have to say. That's what you want. Don't you want that in every presentation? Well, let me tell you, you can achieve that in almost every presentation if, if your introduction is powerful. Okay, it's, it, this folks, there's, there's books written on this. The power of introduction. Okay, why should you listen to someone? Do you realize there is people who are just employed out there to actually introduce other people? Right? So that whoever the audience is, is going to be more in tune to listen to them? Right? Let me give you the example of this, right? I could say to you, what's that? Yes, every, every the beginning of every army, right? But no, but let me explain this to you in a, in a larger scale so you understand it, right? If I hired a motivational speaker today to speak to all three offices, right? And I said to you guys, all right, gang, uh, this gentleman, uh, his name is... Um, Anthony Robbins, and um, anyways, he's, uh, he's a good speaker, okay? He's got a couple of good messages to deliver to you guys today, so here he is, okay? Anthony Robbins. Now, was that an exciting introduction? No. You'd be like, oh, okay. We'll see what he has to say. But if I say to you, gang, I am so pumped, so excited, so um, honored to introduce the next speaker to you guys. He's been in the motivational and personal development industry for over 30 years. He is a bestseller with more than 10 near bestseller, uh, bestsellers uh, currently. His programs have been translated to over 25 languages. He has traveled the world, traveled the world and presented <coughs> more than countries is considered perfect my life in many ways even though I've never met him his message I've been able to carry and live uh, it is my honor and pride to introduce you guys to Anthony Robbins holy shit <laughs> then it's gonna be different right you know what's that what The words float out of my mouth. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> but is there a difference between those two introductions? You're more prone to listen to the second one than the first one, right? Same person talking after me, but the art of introduction. You have to have a good introduction to your referral presentation. One that is powerful, one that evokes trust, and one where people are going to listen to you. All you really, let me ask you a question. Do you not believe that if anyone that you talk to in the field listens to you attentively, listens, really listens to you and is interested in what you have to say, you should be closing 60 to 70% of people that you meet, right? Yeah. The reason why you can't do that is because sometimes people are not going to listen, right? For whatever reason, they're preoccupied, they're not interested, they don't want whatever, whatever, okay? What I'm trying to tell you right now is that with referrals, if you set it up right, from the minute you walk, actually from the minute you phone call that person, 
Okay, it starts with the phone call, actually, right? It's a chain of events that can lead to somebody really attentively listening to you. That's all this is, right? And that's all we really want. If you think about it, you're not interested in anything else but that person listening to you. You're going to achieve that by establishing that trust. And you build that trust from the person who got you there. So the union gets us in front of union leads. Not really, but we could say that, right? I mean, it's really the member. The union is just the, union is just the bridge, right? Between us and the member. The member, by their actions, gets us in front of them, right? A referral, we get in front of a referral by the actions of somebody that they like, trust, is in their family, etc. So the key there is to build upon that relationship, to establish that trust, and you do it at the beginning. Another thing that I do in my referral presentation is I allude to the fact we're going to present additional benefits and that at the end, I'm going to simply ask them for a simple yes or no. I say that at the beginning. I just don't say it at the mandatory read-off letter because then you're too close to, to you know, the actual uh, offer. And what happens is if you don't say that at the beginning and you only say it as you're getting really close to the offer, in other words, when the mandatory read letter shows up, it's, it's too close to the, to the end. So it may seem like a pressure tactic. You don't want that. There's no pressure here. See, the only pressure we utilize in our process is the pressure of silence after a closing question. But there's really no pressure. We don't need everybody to buy. Because if you work the activity model, you don't need everyone to buy. And by the way, you're not supposed to sell everyone that you see. If you had a 100% closing ratio, it's one of two things. You're not working that hard, actually, or you're a con artist. I don't think anybody likes any of those. Uh, am I correct? Toronto, Markham? Mm -hmm. No con artists here, and no one's saying, well, I'm lazy, I'm not going to work hard. No. I believe everyone wants to do well because, first of all, by the clients, okay, we have a responsibility to the families that we serve. Okay, and secondly, for your family, right? So the truth is that, you know, when, um, when you have the activity and you're working the activity, then you're gonna find you don't have to pressure anyone for this. You need to make enough presentations and good presentations so individuals are gonna be compelled to purchase to protect their family. You know, ultimately, they're not gonna buy for your reasons, my reasons, or the reasons of the company. They're, they have to buy for their reasons. They have to buy because it's the right thing for their family. And that's why there's, there shouldn't be any pressure. Okay? Yes, we should overcome objections. Yes, we should encourage people to purchase. Yes, we should try to close five or six times. But I don't consider that pressure, folks. I consider that believing in what we are doing. And sometimes, listen, I mean, haven't you had a conversation with a friend or a family member where you were trying to persuade them or influence to, to do certain things for their own good, right? For their own good. Raise your hand if you've done that. And raise your hand if they actually listened the first time you said it. Yes. No. What about the second time? Wow. No hands go up. What about the third or fourth or fifth time? Then sometimes people start listening, right? Parents. Parents. Is it only once you got to tell your kids to do something? or multiple times, same thing, right? So sometimes asking someone to do the same thing five, six, seven times is not pushing. You may think, well, I don't wanna put, listen, it's to protect their family, okay? Think of, think of that person dying tomorrow. Think of that person dying tomorrow. Look at husband and wife and picture one of them dead tomorrow. Let me ask you a question. Should you have pushed a little bit harder for that family? Should you have? Yes? All agree? Yes? 100%. I'd rather walk away from a house knowing I did my best to persuade them to protect their family than walking away from the house and saying, eh, I don't know, man. I don't think they were going to do it. Yeah. Yeah, they want to think. They want to think about it. They, they just, they, 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 they,
I'd rather walk away and say, I couldn't do it, but I tried my best doing it. Let me give you a story, folks, okay? I have to live with this, okay? I have to live with this for the rest of my career because this happened to me, okay? I went to see a person in Brampton, okay? Local 183 member in Brampton. This is years ago, okay? Gave my presentation. He gave me referrals. He gave me his two sons, okay? Two adult children. Well, older, older uh, adult uh, sons, right? Collected the referrals, okay? Called the one son, okay? Called the one son. He denied the appointment right away. He says, buddy, thank you. Yeah, my dad told me about it. Yeah, man, you know what? No, 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 I'm not, not interested. Okay, no problem. Called the other son who lives in the house. And the father, actually, the father didn't want to buy any insurance for himself because his wife had just gone through cancer, okay? And he was kind of, you know, not in a good, not in a good spot anyway. And he said to me, listen, you know what? I'll deal with this at a later time. I'm just kind of, but here's my son. Stop them, blah, 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 right? One of them lived outside the house, which is the first one I called. The other one lived in the, in the basement, okay? The one that I called first lived outside the home. He, did not, he declined the appointment, right? The second referral was the son that lived in the house, okay? I called the son. And he didn't decline the appointment. He said, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the insurance guy, you came, yeah, 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 okay. You know what, man, just call me later on. We'll, you know, we'll figure it out. This week I'm busy, but whatever, right? Not this time, right? He didn't say he's not interested. All he said to me is, call me later, right? In other words, I couldn't book it at the time, but he didn't say no. I put that referral back in my stack, okay? And unfortunately, because I was about a year and a half into the business, okay, Every time I looked at that referral, I simply remember the fact that he didn't give me an appointment. And I, I kept thinking, oh yeah, this is the guy. I'll call him another day. And I put it back in the pot because I started thinking, okay? In other words, I wasn't doing, I was thinking. One fine day, I'm kind of low on activity. I say, man, I better get going. Right? I'm going to call everything today. I start calling all my leads. <coughs> I come across that one. Okay? I called it. The father picks up. The son died in a car accident. Folks, when I heard those words, I felt I disserviced that family because the truth is this. One of two things should have happened. I should have kept calling the guy until he gave me an appointment or he would have told me, listen, just beat it, okay? Not interested. But I didn't do my job. I put it in the pie and I started thinking, you know? And because, you know, one day, of course, you know, okay, I got to book appointments, okay? Josh is saying we got to get the activity. I'm going to get the activity. I go back to all my leads. I have to find that out, okay? He died in a car crash at Victoria Park in the 401, coming back home from work, okay? 23, 24-year-old guy, okay? I could have insured that guy. In that family, no pain can take, no money can take away the pain they went through from losing their 24-year-old son, okay? But I can tell you, financially, I could have made a difference to them, okay? That's, that was my fault. I don't ever want any one of you in this office in Toronto or in Markham have a story like the one I'm telling you, okay? Yes, I'm still in, obviously I'm here, but I have to live with that because I thought that, okay, you know what? Let me just put it aside, put it aside, put it aside. You don't realize how good you can do for people if you get in front of them, you know? You have a mission to protect working families, you see? I could have done a better job for that family if I just stopped thinking. And I did my job every phone room, okay? Which we'll talk about later on about phone room because I gotta tell you folks, if, if you are okay with underperforming and not doing well, this is probably not a company for you. Because here, there's only two options. You will be successful at whatever rate of success you wanna achieve or you won't be here. Okay, and I say that not to scare anyone. I don't want to scare people. I just want to bring reality to you because do you agree that the success is, is, a different, is different for everyone here? 
right? What could be successful for one person could be unsuccessful for another person. Okay, so we're gonna define success according to your definition. What is success for you in terms of finan financially? And we're gonna ensure that you are achieving your level of success, whatever you wanna achieve. Okay, I know if, if, if someone like Rogi only wrote $100,000 net ALP, she wouldn't be in this company, right? Because she's used to writing $400,000, right? I know if as a manager, I could never write a million net ALP, I wouldn't be in this company as a manager, right? To me, every MGA should strive for a million net. That's to me the magic number. Just like every agency strives to 100,000 a week, every MGA should strive to a million net ALP, okay? So that's, so again, the level of success is different for everyone. But what we will not have here is anyone unsuccessful, okay? Because this is not a place to, to come here and be unsuccessful. And yes, there's a learning curve. Yes, there's steps. Yes, there's a process. Yes, it doesn't happen overnight, okay? But people have to be taking actions necessary to make sure that is, that is a reality for them, you know? Because that's what you came here to do, is to achieve goals and achieve a reality for yourself. Otherwise, there's no reason why. I mean, this is too hard of a job, actually, you know, to do without being successful. This is the toughest, toughest, toughest forty to sixty thousand dollar a year career anyone can find. Once you grasp it, is the easiest. Hundred thousand dollars, actually, not even hundred thousand dollars. Six figures. Not a the first digit is not necessarily a one. Okay. Six figure career. Once you grasp it. Okay. Grasp it means once you get a hang of it. Once you run it. Not that it runs you, you run it. You know what you're doing. You have complete autonomy and control of your career, you know? Uh, and that's it, folks, you know? But going back to it, you know, not to get, uh, again, going back to the theme that we have here today, which is referral collection. What are we doing with time? 118. All right. Not bad. Okay. So establishing, establishing the relationship between the referee and the refer, right? And building upon that trust, okay? It's very important that, um, that you, when, you, when you're talking about, I'll give you an example. When you're talking about the person who got you there, create a backstory. I'll give you an example on this. If I'm seeing John and Mary, for example, and John is the brother of uh, Peter, just to keep it, keep it consistent. And I happen to have been in Peter's house, the same day an important event took place, such as a family dinner, right? So if I was there on that day, I would mention that to John. And I would say, John, in fact, you know what? I, was, I saw your brother the day that your mom and dad were going over there for dinner, right? Would he know that information? Should he know that information? He should. That's part of my backstory. So I'll, I'll, I'll drop that event as I am talking to John, because it's likely he would know that's what happened that day, okay? You know, I'll give you an example. I went to see a referral, this is a while ago, in Mississauga. When I went to see this young lady and her husband, I mentioned that her parents were leaving that same day on vacation. They were going to Panama, okay? So, I, actually not that same day, the, the following day. Not the same day that they left, but the day after. Right? So I went there on a Saturday. They took off on a Sunday. Okay? I mentioned that to her. In fact, you know the day I was there? Uh, whatever her name was. is the day uh, before your parents left to Panama. Oh, yeah, that's right. That morning you were there. That's right. I was there. And I met, and I remember the name of the dog. And I met whatever the dog's name was. Right? <laughs> you know? So little details like that, right, will build my credibility with that person. Because all of a sudden they know, yeah, well, this person really did go see my parents. This person really did meet my parents. Because they know stuff, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to say intimate information. It's not intimate information, but information about them that how else would I know unless I met them, right? You know, what's that? It's the same that most people won't. Yeah, most people won't know. But that's part of me paying attention to the person I'm with and building that backstory, right? You know, because this is the backstory that's going to calm them down. When I say calm them down, it's, it's going to be easier for you to build that trust in, in that relationship with them in the beginning. And it goes back to the introduction, the power of making a strong introduction at the beginning of your presentation. Okay? 
Because once you establish that, folks, I got to tell you, it's easy. The referral presentation is one of the easiest presentations we make in this company. Because all of a sudden, you know, if, if first of all, they know exactly what's going on. Right? By the way, should, 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 shouldn't they know exactly what's going on at that point in time? Right? I mean, I use the line, there's no secret as to what we do. What's the name of our company? Who do we represent? American? Income? Life insurance company. So when somebody asks, what do you guys do? Oh my God, I mean, look at a folder. How many of you have the blue folder on the table when you're making a presentation? Right? Well, doesn't that kind of give it away? You know? And when somebody says to you folks, are you trying to sell life insurance? And you're at the kitchen or dining table? Don't say no. Simply say, there's benefits you're entitled to that I'm going to present to you that you may qualify for. I'm not saying no. I'm not going to say, yes, I am here to sell you life insurance. Because that may just be a little bit too blunt and they may not like it and they may just turn off at that point in time. Right? All agree? Right? Sometimes people can't handle the truth yet. Yet. They're going to listen. But if you say it in a way, yeah, there's benefits you're entitled to. I'm going to present and explain those to you. So there's no secret as to what we do. Right? They'll appreciate that. You know? But sometimes people say, well, you do. No. Me selling? No. No, 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 no. <coughs> we don't do that. We don't sell any life insurance. That's just, you know, the name of the company, but nothing to do with that. Don't worry about it. Come on. <laughs> they get a folder that says American Income Life. They get a phone call. Hi, I'm calling from American Income Life Insurance Company. <laughs> you know, they get a summary sheet in their email. Come on, right? You know, so simply say, yeah, there's no secret as to what we do. There's benefits you're entitled to. That's the key word, entitled to. Doesn't mean you have to do it. Doesn't mean you may qualify for it. You know, how many of you have met someone who can't can qualify for anything? There you go. So you can say that to almost everyone you meet, and you're going to be bang on sometimes. And if you say that to them, you can tell them, yeah, I told you you wouldn't qualify. Right? But you do, Mary. Right? You know, switch it to the person who can't qualify, right? Anyways, right? So, you know, it's, it's part of your introduction, folks. And the one thing you got to make sure you're having is you're having fun. You know, when you're making these presentations for, it doesn't matter what kind of person, what kind of lead type you're working, it doesn't matter. Be sure to look like you're, you're having a good time. Be sure to look like you are supposed to be there. How many of you have gone to a restaurant and received bad service? Because the person is either angry, upset, you know, they're late with their order and all that. Doesn't that kind of give you a bad taste for that organization, that, that place? Well, make sure no one can ever say that about your presentation, okay? And remember, it's none of your business how people react, okay? I'm going to tell you this right now. How people react to you is none of your business because you can't control how people react. You can only control what you do, how you do it, and how you portray and present yourself in the company, okay? The fact that some people are going to react negatively, don't worry about it because it's not everyone, okay? I always say this. There's only about 20 really nasty people in the world. Problem is they move around a lot. So you're gonna catch some of them. That's okay. Just remember what I told you. Okay, that's one of those people Byron said. He's one of them. You know, what you can do for them, right? Just, you know what? Once you leave the house, wish them the best. That's it. That's, that's the best thing you can do to someone who's having a bad day or has a bad life. Wish them the best. That's it. Maybe some positive will come to them because of your wishes. Send a wish to the universe for them. Say a prayer for them. Whatever you want. Wish them the best. That's all you can do. Recognize, okay, this is one of those 20 nasty people that move around. You know? I've seen three of those today. Anyways. <laughs> Just kidding. You know? But, but that's it, right? You know, write it off. It's a write-off. Okay. 
there's always a lesson though, because I tell you, sometimes those that are really tough and, and just against things, they, they, they build your skin, man, you know? Because everyone hates rejection. I said this many times. I don't like it too, okay? I don't like it when they say no to me or they don't listen to me. Here's the difference though. I get over it really fast. It takes me about not even a second to get over it. Like, done. Actually, no, done. Actually, done, 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 done. You see? That's how fast you need to get over it. But it still bothers me. I st it still, you know, plucks a nerve in my head, okay, or in my heart when somebody rejects me, okay? But I'm fast to identify, okay, it's not personal. They're not rejecting me as a person. They're re rejecting my offer, my presentation, my company, my product, right? So it's not personal. That's it. It's business. Okay, no problem. Move on. That's it. So building the relationship of uh, building the trust of the referral, establishing that by asking those questions. You know, fair to say, John Mary, that you trust your brother, you trust your father, you trust your mother, you trust your friend. Fair to say they wouldn't send me out here to do any harm to you. Yes and yes. You need to get those two yeses. Two yeses at the beginning. And then you can go into your standard script, which was given to you, right? which you explain the sponsorship and everything else you're doing right now. I would also say, introduce the fact that you will show them additional benefits that they may qualify for, which they are entitled to. And at the end, you're gonna ask for a simple yes or no. So you're saying that at the beginning of the presentation and you're saying it when your, your manager read-off letter pulls up, okay? So it's reinforced there, okay? And then you're doing the exact same thing after that, okay? Now, moving on to the next thing before we wrap this up. So, phone room, okay? Here's the deal, folks, okay? When it comes to phone room, you know, the, the, the aim for every phone room is to fill up two days of activity and a head start for the following day, okay? And I'll tell you this right now, okay? I know, I know that come 7 o'clock, forget 7 o'clock, Come five o'clock, some of you wish phone room was over. And you could say, oh man, couldn't I just go home right now and just enjoy the rest of my night? And I'll tell you this right now, folks. I am all for doing that, provided the job gets done. Okay? And I'll say this to you right now. The aim should always be to have full, full days, the next two days. And I'm talking to, I'm specifically talking right now to anyone here six months or less, okay? Specifically, if you've been in this company for less than six months, and even more so, less than 90 days, okay? Please understand this. The reason why we have phone room is to ensure their success, successful setup for Tuesday and Wednesday, on a Monday, for Friday and Saturday, on a Thursday, or Friday and Sunday on a Thursday, okay? It has no other motive, only one your success. We know it's very easy for anyone in this business to get off the hook if you're home. In other words, you're home. How many of you have distractions in your home? Please raise your hand. How many have more than one distraction in your home? Please keep your hand up. So by us keeping you in the office till the job is done or time is up, we simply want to ensure your success. And I'll be very clear to you right now. Okay, just like in Toronto, it happens. Not all the veterans are there because there will be a time, provided if you're not going to be in leadership, let's say you're going to be just in the field producing, there will be the time that your presence is not required in the form because you have proven that you can go out there and you can do the job. In other words, you need little to no supervision at this point to perform and to do your thing. We will not bug you, okay? But if that is not happening, and, you are in your, and you're in your first six months of your career, sorry, we care for your success. And the deal is, phone rooms Mondays, phone rooms Thursdays, to have proper days of activity. And if you book eight and eight, which is 16 appointments for two days, and the time is 7 p.m., and you have a full schedule, goodbye, goodbye, go home, go enjoy dinner. In fact, Pick up dinner for your family. Here's a card for you. We will reward people, okay? 
We will reward people. How many times we've we rewarded people here for a phone room, for a good job in a phone room? Many times, okay? And it's gonna happen across all agencies. That if you have appointments set up for the next two days, man, go home, okay? You know, so the, the thing about it is this, and specifically for those of you who are brand new, you see, I am not gonna do that to someone who's been here a year, two years, has qualified for convention, made it to President's Club, etc. Those things, they know how to do the job. All I'm gonna say is keep doing your job. Keep going out there and make your money, do those things. Because no office, no office is designed to have everybody in it doing for them. Do you realize that, right? So as time progresses, we have to rotate people out of the office so that they can do their job at home. It's fine, provided they're doing their job. But if someone's not doing their job, it would be bad leadership not to ask them to come into the office because we care that they are successful. How, how many of you would, would rather work late on a Monday to make sure Tuesday and Wednesday are profitable or cut off your day early on a Monday and make no money Tuesday and Wednesday and come Friday and look, oh man, I didn't got no production these last two days. Like what, what, what is better? Option one or option two? Option one. Option one because we got to make sure the production is there. So I'll tell you right now, anyone leaving the phone room before time is up better have the appointments. And if the person is going to do that all the time and not have the appointments, folks, we are not responsible for their results. You see, if you stay for the phone room and you're doing what you're told and, and it's not happening, we will help you fix it. But if you're not staying for the phone room and you're not getting the results, how can we help you fix it? The first thing we said is you got to stay for the length of the phone room. We know you're going to pick up more appointments in the last two hours. Okay. And it's important, you know, and here's the thing. If you don't see, cause here's the unspoken reality. Let's talk about the elephant that's in the room right now. Many of you hate to make calls. Oh, come on. Raise your hand, raise your hand and admit I don't like that part of the job. Oh, come on. We got people here that are just laughing because they know I'm telling the truth. Toronto, <laughs> am I telling the truth right now? Yes? Okay. Okay. So I heard you. You don't like that part. Well, guess what? I can't extract it. Okay? I can't get rid of it. No one can get rid of it. Okay? And let me ask you all a question. On all the, on any job you had in the past, wasn't there one or two things you really didn't like? Raise your hand. Well, I've, I've only had this job, so I don't count, right? So what about you? Wasn't there always something that you disliked about it? Right? Yes? I'm asking you all, yes? Yeah? You dealt with it though, didn't you? It had to be dealt with. See, I don't want this ever to be something you, you love everything about it. Oh yeah, I love making phone calls. I love making, doing my resolutions. Oh my God. I love doing my resolutions, building folders. I do it singing. You know, I love doing that. Cancellations. Oh my God. They make my day. You know, when I get a cancellation, I'm just so happy. I, just, I love that. I love my cancellations. I love my chargebacks. I love all those things about what we do. I love them. No, you're not going to love everything, but it's the reality of the business. Okay, so you got to deal with it. And until you get really good at what you do, then there's steps to follow so we can ensure your success, period, end of story. Okay, because all we want you folks is you want, we want, understand something folks, when you are here, we are investing into you. Time, resources, leads. Okay, so you can have an opportunity for a career. Okay, this is a two way street. We invest into you, whether you realize it or not, <coughs> for everyone here. And it's a cost I'm happy to assume because I want you to do well. Every chair in this organization in Oakville, in Markham, in Toronto is $90,000 a year. Every chair. So, guess what? If we have 100 chairs, that should be eh, 9 million. Do we have 100 chairs? Probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah, just in Toronto, there's like 70 chairs. Yeah. 
you know? So that's the potential we have. If we fill up every chair here and everyone has the potential of $90,000 a year, just to give you a round number, assuming there's a hundred chairs, we should be a $9 million a year organization. <coughs> Simple way to look at it, right? Perspective, right? From a business point of view, right? So understand folks, when it comes to the phone room, okay? It's not a suggestion, it's something that we do, and it's not forever. If you're only gonna be a producer, see, I don't say with management because management has to be here to train people, right? You know? So it's a different commitment. But if you're only gonna be a producer, and you can be doing your job, and having activity, quality, and production at levels that make your, you happy with your income, God bless you. Keep doing what you're doing, come in once a week for the meetings, Pick up your check, pick up your supplies. Goodbye. We'll see you next week. Life can be really good that way. Simple. But you have to get it to that point. Okay? If it's not at that point, it's our job to help you. Okay? And sometimes, remember, patients are not supposed to like the medication. Am I correct? You know? Fortunately, I can't sugarcoat these things. See, a child, you can give the Tylenol, right? And it's always that pink stuff. Right? They actually like it. It's medication. It is sugar-coated. Okay? This is not sugar-coated. This is what it is. Okay? And you have to understand what it is. Phone room commandments, folks. You got to be calling on your referrals first. Simple. You have to be calling, actually, you have to be calling on your policy deliveries, amendments, and CODs first. Then you call on your referrals. Then you call on your POS leads. Then you call on your non-no-shows and reschedules. And last, you call on your child saving union leads. Look at that order. Those are called last. First is your policy service items, amendments, CODs, policies to be delivered. You've been paid on those already. Second is your referrals. Third is your POS leads. Fourth is your no-shows and reschedules. And last is your leads, your child saving union leads. Problem some of you have is, guess what you're calling first? The brand new stuff Avram just gave me. Oh, I got a fresh pack here. <sighs> and you start, you know, looking at the leads and fantasizing the lead on the no. You got to call on the other stuff. Okay? You got to call on the other stuff. That those are the last ones. Because here's what's coming. I'm going to tell you this right now, folks. This is not to scare anyone. This is not to to this is not a punishment or anything. But we will implement and, and again, I'm not saying it's happening next week or the week after. Where we're going to practice uh, what I call a, um, a lead retreat. Is we're going to retreat with no leads. Think, think about that for a second. No leads for two weeks. Not because we don't have. We got. We got tons. Between child safe, between POS, between the, the, the uh, update on the child safe leads, folks. I got to tell you, I saw a presentation on Friday on that. What an opportunity we have with those leads. POS, all that, right? But in other, in other words, if you know you're not going to get leads for two weeks and you got leads today, what should you really do and make sure you're going to do? You're going to collect a lot of referrals because I'm going to say to you, guess what? Two weeks, nothing. I'm smiling at the camera. Can you all hear me there in Toronto? Yes? yes? Yeah? Markham? Yeah? Now let me ask you, if you know you're not going to get stuff for two weeks, wouldn't you want to make sure you keep making money for those two weeks? Yeah. What's the only way you're going to do it? Referrals. That's it. So it's either going to happen because you're going to do it, or it's going to happen because we're going to force it. Either way, it's going to happen. And I always say this, folks. Do you realize there's only two two really strong um, feelings that push people. There's only two. There's only two. The desire to gain or the fear of losing. So you're going to collect referrals because you have the desire to do more. Or you're going to collect referrals because you have the fear of not doing enough. Here's the good news. You choose which one drives you. That's, that's up to you. 
because we will keep teaching this. I will keep training this. I will keep talking about this because I want you all to embrace this and run with it. Okay, because I know what it's gonna to do to your business. Okay, so what I'm gonna do right now, last 10 minutes, is we're gonna open up questions right now uh, across three offices. So let's start with this office here. What questions do we have? I see that. No questions. Oh, we have to do when. Says it. The person say they have two. Or more. So they they only want to give two. Yep. They only want to give two. Byron, can you yeah. read the questions? Yeah. So uh, Cesar is asking the question. Uh, what do you do when somebody says I only have two people to give? In other words, they only are willing to give two, right? Um, there's a couple of things you can do. Thing number one is say, you know what? Two is good, but most members sponsor an average of 10. Let's see if you can get to at least five. Who would you like to sponsor next? And you look at the screen and you wait for them to say somebody else. If they say the same thing, no, we're only going to give two. Then I would turn to them and smile and say, okay, you know what? How about just one more? Who would you like to sponsor next? And if they still say no, we're only gonna give two, I would say, no problem. We'll keep it at two and move on. That's it, right? And by the way, folks, when, you, when, when they say no to you on the referrals, make sure your face doesn't look depressed <laughs> because the problem some of you have is people start saying no to you and your face looks like someone just died or they just insulted you. And that's a problem because what you're telling them in the home is you're telling them that you're affected by their responses. Okay? So make sure at all times you're smiling. Make sure at all times because it shouldn't really bother you if they don't give you more than... See, here's the thing. If you're doing it right you're gonna be collecting four or more per home. If you're struggling with it, right, then your attitude may be also affecting it because all of a sudden you know they're not gonna give you, they, they're good, they don't give you, and it shows in your face. So just like sometimes when people say no at the end, they don't wanna buy, and sometimes they feel like they should apologize to you because they see your face, it's like, oh, did we just upset this person, you know? No, make sure that you're not affected by that, you know? Because again, if you're affected by that, you're putting too much pressure on yourself and not, and not enough pressure on the system. Here's what I can tell you, it's gonna affect you we only, when you only have four presentations for the week. If you only have four or five presentations for the week, it's every one of those that says no, it's gonna hit you hard. And you're gonna remember them very well, by the way. I find anyone that doesn't have enough activity remembers all their presentations to the T, to detail. Oh yeah, they had a home and the door was this way and it's like, how could you remember all those things? When you have a lot of activity, you don't have, there's not, there's not even time to remember that, that much detail. In fact, you forget the ones that don't buy really fast. You see? Because the pressure is not on you. The pressure is on the system. Right? Did I answer your question? Yeah. I really answered it. I over, I over answered it. You got more there. Any other question from Markham from Toronto? Yes, Vedant? Uh, someone told me that I want to talk with them first, then only I can give you numbers. Uh, so what could yeah. be? Uh, yeah, what, so whenever that happens, is they're really telling you that there's not enough trust that you established with that person that they feel the need they have to talk to somebody else. I, I'll just look at the camera. Yeah. <laughs> When they're saying that to you is because there's not enough trust built there. But what you have to do is this. If you hear that often, if you hear that objection often, it means there's something broken in the way you're asking. Okay? If you're only hearing that once in a while, here's what you can say to combat that. Okay? Uh, say, John, Mary, you know what? I actually want you to talk to them because I wouldn't feel comfortable contacting them unless you've briefed them. Okay? So I'm going to ask that tonight, at the very latest tomorrow, you give your family members a call and you let them know I met with you in your home and that you sponsored and received these no cost benefits. Okay? Once again, who would you like to sponsor next? And I go back to closing. 
right? The key is for every time they give you an objection on referrals, you overcome it and you go back to who would you like to sponsor next? And you look at your screen. Don't look at them. Look at your screen in a matter of you're expecting them at that point in time to give you a referral. Okay. If I look at John and I say, so John, so who would you like to sponsor next? <laughs> Not gonna work. So John, who'd you like to sponsor next? Hands on the keyboard and I'm looking at the screen. Okay? That's the only pressure you use. All right? Did I answer your question, Madame? Yes. Sorry, just I don't know. Didn't David say that just tell him, okay, yeah, just give him a call right now. You know what I mean? So that's another thing that, that you guys picked up on Monday. You know? The problem with that is Here's why I may not do that. If they don't answer, you're done. Whereas if you get it, right, you can keep calling. Not a million times, but maybe three million times. Just kidding. Uh, no, that's why, right? So the question was, David said in his training, when they say, well, we need to call them first, right? Uh, meaning the person doesn't want to give you the referrals because they want to talk to them. If we tell them, we'll call them now, right? There's two things they can do. They can say, well, no, they're busy now, right? Because they're at work, right? And then you're dead at that point because they don't want to call them, right? Or they can call them, but if they don't get a hold of them, right? You're dead too, right? Now, in the off chance, they may pick up, right? And then you may have a good referral there, right? That's why I'd much rather at that point in time just take the name and number, right? You know? Yeah. More questions? Byron, just to clarify, what we're looking for is a minimum to leave a phone room. Is it eight appointments booked for the next two days each day? Yeah, 16. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What else? Can you hear me? Yes. Who's that? Vanya. Vanya. Yes. So on Saturday, I had a presentation which I know that I could have sold if I went about it the right way. At the end, um, when I asked them which option worked, they started talking amongst each other in Portuguese. So what I did was I said, you know, I'm going to go call my next appointment. Let them know I'm going to be a couple minutes late. So I stepped out to let them speak. Um, and when I came back, they said, you know, we're okay with the price. We love the program, but if our past experience has taught us that we're ever made to have to make a decision on the spot, it never ends up well. So I'm going to take the chance and say no. I see. Okay. Well, so it's more of a closing question, right? So here's what I would recommend you say to, to them and to really anyone. Did everyone hear the question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, you know, everyone that is buying from us, should buy for their reasons. And though we emphasize the fact that, sorry. So we emphasize the fact that we're only there once. That should never be the reason why somebody's purchasing from, from us, okay? Now, but let me give you what you can say so that it makes sense for them. Because the truth is this, right? 99.9% .9 of the sales you will make and have made in the field happen in a one-time visit, correct? You went there and you closed, right? 0 0.0001 of the sales this agency has across three offices happen when somebody calls you back, right? In other words, you saw someone a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, and they called you back. And as they come back and say, right? Mm -hmm. That can happen, but it's not gonna happen often, and you can't make a living expecting it, right? So what you should say, Vanya, and everyone, is this John Mary, I appreciate what you're telling me. The truth is this, is that we don't want you to do this because we're only here once. We want you to do this because it's the right thing for your family. In other words, the reason why thousands of members do this is because they realize it's the right thing for their family and it makes sense. And of course, it doesn't take food off the table. So if I remember correctly, you say this all makes sense to you you like the plan, 
and it's not taking food off your table. If I can make a recommendation is start the plan today, qualify for it, it needs to get approved. Once it's approved, I will come back and deliver it to you. At that point in time, you can increase it, you may reduce it, but you're in the driver's seat. The longest journey starts with the first step. Today is the day you need to take the first step, right? And the truth is this, you know, if I was gonna be someone that was never gonna see you again, I would feel the same way not to do this today. But the truth is this, my job is not done until I deliver that plan to you and you're happy with the coverage. And at that point in time, we can always make amends to you, right? So the only question I have for you is which option will work best for you? Option one or option two? And I go back to closing, right? The key with everything, you notice, is after you overcome an objection, go back to closing. And closing is, so do you want it or not? No, no, no. Closing is option between something and something else. Always. Okay? Always, always, always. Did I answer your question, Mania? Yes, thank you. Bro. What else? So, Roger, Roger. with the uh, free of choice certificate, what's the actual mechanism you use to transfer that money? Is it, is it a check courier? Is it electronic? It's a check. It's a check. The, the a home office sends directly to the funeral home. I don't think it's courier. I think it's just sent. It's sent to you, right? But upon the home office receiving the proof of death certificate from the funeral home, the proof of death claim form from our company, the freedom of choice certificate completed on the back, and the invoice from the funeral home, which all of them are available immediately, right? Folks, there was, a, there was a, uh, a, um, an article released on the spotlight last year. Our company, take a guess what the average turnaround for claims is for AIL. Do you remember that article? Yeah, five days. Five calendar days. calendar days. Not five business days, five calendar days. I share with you all the claims report. How many of you have a claims report in your binder? In your binder, you have to have that claims report. That claims report shows over $400,000 in claims. Josh, that's something that maybe we can have everybody have it. It's available on CAS. You have, we have access now to every single claim file in the last 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, where you can confidently show it to someone, and it's, it's confidential, it doesn't have the name of the client or anything, okay? It just has a policy number, the type of plan and the amount paid out. We did the math an hour, okay, just between the policies up north and here, over $400,000 in claims paid out. I can safely assume that now shall and pass being one office, that if I were to, I'm just guessing, but I would say that number in the last 90 days is probably touching a million in claims paid, okay? Because with that much POS active in Toronto since 1990, Okay, since 1990, American Inc. has been writing business in Ontario. I can tell you, there's tons and tons and tons and tons of, claim, of, uh, of uh, claims being processed every day. <laughs> so going back to Roger's question, how is that um, processed? The freedom of choice is received by the claims department along with three documents, proof of death, which we give them, the proof of death certificate from the funeral home and the invoice of the funeral home. And then we send the we send the check it, uh, directly to the funeral. Yeah, and folks, claims over two years old, uh, under fifteen thousand dollars, are processed like that. Okay, where it's almost like it goes through three different sets of eyes, and that check is cut and sent right away to the funeral home. Okay, and I got to tell you, I mean, we've had, you know, I was in Sudbury in July. Okay. It's kind of funny, we visited a family that the lady was uh, going through cancer treatment. I mentioned this actually. I mentioned this to you all, didn't I? That we went to a home where the lady was going through cancer. Like she showed us all the appointments she had and the times that she went, okay? Uh, that was in the beginning of July. By the end of July, once we submitted all the paperwork, okay? I mean, it took us, you know, we were there on the first day. We stayed there for five days, so the paperwork didn't come back here until a week later. Less than 10 days later, 12 days later, the check was already sent to her. I think it was five, $6,000 on all those cancer visits that she had, okay, from the outpatient and the inpatient treatment, you know, so it's all paid out. So I can tell you folks, when the paperwork is done properly, the home office department wants to process these. I mean, that's the reason why people buy anyway, 
right? What the, what's the sense of buying insurance that's not going to pay out, right? I don't know what the numbers are for 2017, but I can tell you 2016, $171 million was paid out, okay, in claims. $171 million paid out. We also have a question. Yeah. I was just going to tag on to that. How long, like, for the, let's say the difference in the final expenses, how long does that take to reach the beneficiary? So you 30,000 final expenses, 15 goes to the funeral, remaining 15, how long does that take? I would say probably a similar number of days because they wouldn't cut the check and hold it. They would cut the check and send it both. Both. Send yeah. both at the same time. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. One with your home, one with yeah. the Yeah. Yeah. Well they don't ACH that. They send it. Oh okay. Yeah, they send it. Yeah. Any other question? Toronto Markham? No? We're right on time, folks. It's two PM. Okay. This shall continue on Thursday. Thursday at 2 p.m., additional training on referrals, on, on anything that we have to do to, to make sure everyone's moving forward, okay? On that oh, note, yeah. Question, please. Can you hear me? Yes, hi, Rogi. Hi. Uh, hi, Byron. Uh, one question, because Garmik asked me a question this morning, which she can ask you. You can give her the answer. Garmik. What's your three questions? Okay. The... Uh, uh, when she talks about the cancer and stuff, they keep telling her, oh, we have critical illness and we have to think about it, review our policy first. Right. What would you say? Well, very simple, right? The critical illness, so, sorry. The critical illness pays for a first diagnosis of critical illness, right? So in other words, if you have a critical illness policy that covers 10, 15, 20 different conditions, right? That only pays a first time diagnosis. So, oh, if you're diagnosed with anything but cancer, that would pay out, correct? But then it lapses after that. You are not covered for anything else after that, even though that critical illness covered cancer. The reason why we separate critical illness from cancer is so that if, God forbid, you're diagnosed with a critical illness, your critical illness policy can pay out, but then your cancer policy is still in effect. And if you are later diagnosed with cancer, you are still covered, number one. Number two, our cancer policy does not replace or compete with any other critical illness. So if God forbid you're diagnosed with cancer, you would get it from both policies. And money doesn't replace money. It's the same thing like saying, you know, I have insurance through my job, but I shouldn't buy insurance outside of my job, right? Of course they should, right? And most people do. And when a claim goes through, they don't say, well, since we have enough through our job, we're going to decline the one claim check. Of course not. Everyone wishes they had more coverage, right? So make the reason why they say they can't buy more the reason why they should buy more. If they say to you, well, we have this, that's exactly why this makes more sense, you know? Because if that pays out on a critical illness uh, claim, then you're not covered anymore. And you can't buy another critical illness policy. They won't give it to you. No one will give it to you. I and if, what you say, but, but I just want to think about it. Can you touch that? Sure. <laughs> well, think about what? I understand what you're saying, but I still have to review my policy and think about it. Should I buy this or not? Well, you know what? I would say to them, John, Mary, you know what? If it makes sense to you, what I'm saying to you makes sense to you and you see there's value, you know, it's to do it today. If it doesn't make sense to you and you don't see any value, then there's actually nothing to think about, right? You know? If you get I want to think about it is because you're not tying up the fact that you're only there once and you need a yes or no today. If you're constantly getting that objection, sir, me, is because they, you are not strong enough in your tie downs that you need a yes or no today. Okay? The constantly I want to think about it, it means you're not establishing the fact that you need a yes or no today. Simple. Because when people know they're supposed to tell you yes or no today, they should only be asking or the question at the end, do we have to make a decision today? And the answer should be yes, absolutely. Right? You know, but if you constantly hear that, that's not a, an objection that you should be overcoming at the end. That's a, be an objection that you should be proactively overcoming by making sure they're going to give you a yes or no today. And the first person that needs to believe that is you, not them. If you believe that they should think about it and deep down you agree with that, you're gonna get that objection a lot. If you believe they should give you a yes or no today, 
and you emphasize that in your mandatory read-off letter and in your introduction, you're going to eliminate that objection more often than not. Clear? Got it, thanks. Yeah. Yes, Vedant? Yeah. Uh, so if we, if we are doing a mandatory read-off letter and then we get an objection, that let's see what you have and then I think about it or I say yes or no. And what should, well, what can we say on that? Well, if they're saying that at that point in time, say, well, either way, John, you know, it's going to be a yes or no today, right? And if you can't get over that, then don't present anything, you know? Because then they're just being polite to see what, what's really happening there to me. The way I interpret that is they don't really believe you have anything valuable to say. And what you have to work on there, if that's happened to you too often, is you have to work on what kind of connection and rapport you're building with the client. Because why is like I said to you in the beginning, what is the number one thing you want the minute you walk into somebody's house is for someone to actually listen to you, listen to you because you have something important to say. That's something that you're going to portray in your presentation. That's not something that at some point in time, they're going to say, well, this guy's here now for half an hour. Might as well listen. No, 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 no. Your introduction, the power or lack thereof will determine whether or not someone's going to be listening to you. And if you're getting that at the end in your mandatory read-off letter, that means there's no, there's no, man, there's no, there's nothing there. You know, it's almost like they're willing to let go of that at that point in time, you know? So I would work harder in the foundation of the presentation, on the introduction of the presentation. Yeah, somebody, I can't see who it is, but. Great. Prince! Yes. What's up, Prince? <coughs> I'm good, Andrew. Um, I met a family yesterday of two brothers and their two wives. After the presentation and everything, and the guy said, look, we don't know anything about AIL. Is there a website that we can go and research or you have anything to show us? And then I brought up my, my company files, my junior files, and I gave to them and they went through it and they said, okay. But you see, we still have to do some research because we don't know AIL. Can what, day, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. What kind of what kind of lead was this? So the child safe. Child safe. Okay. So when that happens, is just building more credibility on the child uh, on the on the company at the beginning, you know? Because remember, no matter this is exactly what I was saying in the beginning, no matter what type of lead you're servicing, no matter what type of lead you're working, okay, it is your job to build credibility to the reason why you're there. This, I, was, this was after I already played the, the video. I played the first video. Right, right. So uh, listen, you know what? Ultimately, if you're gonna hear that too often, then we have to check what you're saying, how you're saying it. If this was the first time you heard that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about it. First time. First time, then don't worry about it. It okay. could be that one person that, that they're gonna find fault. They're gonna tell you, you know what? The sun is actually not round. Okay. It's square. Exactly. Well, I mean, they were nasty about it. They were just skeptical about it, right? You know, but I mean, I've had people say to me, you know, oh, this is an American company. I go, yeah, just like your Ford at the front, you know, it's like whatever, right? You know, sometimes when they say something ridiculous, you have to answer with something ridiculous, right? And laugh about it, not in an antagonistic fashion. But it's like, you know, it's like, you know, we're joking here, right? Like I said, you couldn't be possibly serious saying that, right? You know, um, but again, if that only happened once, I wouldn't sweat it. But just make sure you really build up the credibility of the company and how we got there. We only got there because they requested the child safe kit. And if you make it, you make it very clear. And here's a line that everybody can use. Everybody can use this line. You can use this line with referrals. You can use this line with child safe kits. You can use this line with union members, okay? <coughs> the only reason why we're here today is because you requested a child safe kit from a company. Is that fair to say? Yeah? Yes? Yes? Oh, man. Yeah. I'm the one talking, but you, 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 you guys are the ones tired? Holy yeah. cow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. John Mary, the only reason why we're here today is because you sent this back. You sent this, you sent this card back from the union. Yes? Yes. yes. John Mary, the only reason why we're here today is because your brother, your father, your mother, your sister, your cousin thought of you. Yes? Yes. That's it. 
So I'm building upon that credibility by one single question. I can smash a lot of objections because all of a sudden they can't get, you know, I'm here because someone requested me to be here. Someone you, or they did anyways, right? Or someone that, you know, likes you, loves you, is your family, relate, whatever, send me here, right? So that goes back to building the credibility, you know? So just make sure folks, remember, ultimately, people are gonna decide whether or not they're gonna listen to you in the first minute or three minutes based on your introduction. If you have a good introduction, people will listen. If you have, if you suck at your introduction, you're gonna struggle. And it doesn't mean it's all lost. At some point in time, it can turn where they're gonna start listening because all of a sudden they know, okay, you know what? This is some, this is some good stuff. You know, somebody told me on Saturday, it's interesting, this happened. This person went from not wanting to even book an appointment, didn't want to see anybody, right? Like, no, 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 we don't mind, no, 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 no. To fine, come in. Then at the door, I don't want to hear anything. I, you know, I know exactly what you guys are going to do. I don't want to, to, okay, never mind, sit down. To, I, you know, to, okay, what do you got? <laughs> to, hmm, this is really good. Truth is, at the end, the person didn't buy. However, this person managed to overcome every single one of the objections and get it all the way to the end, right? And we talked about it, and it's like, you know what? Maybe a little bit, a, a little bit extra push would have gotten you the sale, right? Asking a few more times would have gotten you the sale. But the victory is that sometimes it doesn't matter what they say on the phone. Some of you remember what, here's the problem some of you have. Anytime people say on the phone, well, if you're coming to sell something, don't come. You remember that. Don't remember that. Who cares? They gave you an appointment. That's all that matters. Because see, when you're reporting your tracker numbers, can you separate those from your, from your report? And say, well, I had 10 appointments today. But let me just add a note here. The first one didn't want to buy. No, you can't do that. Just, it's just a, ultimately, it's an appointment. It's a presentation. That's, that's all you care about, right? So does that answer your question, Prince? Yes, thank you. Thank you. What else? Okay, last question. All right, I'm done. Okay, gang, we'll see you again on Thursday at 2 p.m. Thank you very much.